Okay, good morning, everybody. Let's uh, get started. Uh, how did things go with Colin on Tuesday? You're all masters of PyroSim now? All good? Okay, so uh, let's talk a little bit about assignment uh, 10. How many people have started in on assignment 10? That's good. Okay. Again, as I mentioned, this is one of the longer and more challenging assignments, one that is not uh, best not left until the night before. So do make sure to get uh, started on assignment 10 as early as possible. Assignment 10 is not the end, but it's the end of the beginning, right? So when you finish assignment 10, you will have all the ingredients you need for conducting your final project, whatever that is, and we'll talk about that next Tuesday when you start in on your final project. The other reason that it is, uh, the other reason that it is not the end but the end of the beginning is it is extremely hard to achieve the behavior that's required in the 10th assignment, with it, which is phototaxis. Here's my best attempt. What you're watching is the same controller. It's going to be evaluated four times. This first time, the light source, which is the small cube. Sorry, let me just start again. The light source is the small cube in front of the robot. And it is moving more or less towards the cube. We're then going to put the robot back at the center and evaluate the same controller a second time with the light source to the robot's right. A third time with the light source behind the robot. And in the fourth trial, when the light source is to the robot's left, it goes in actually the opposite direction. Three out of four ain't bad. How many people have finished assignment 10? How many people have got the robot to do well in one out of the four, at least one out of the four environments? At least two out of the four environments? At least three out of the four environments? Scott, all four? All right, so very difficult. Okay, so let's talk about what's expected when you submit your final video for the final uh, assignment. Before we talk about that, let's just walk through this uh, assignment a little bit. Uh, you just saw the example video, which you can watch at your leisure here. What you, you're gonna be making a lot of changes in, uh, in assignment 10. One of the major ones is that now, as you go through your population, every controller in the population is not going to be evaluated once. It's going to be evaluated number of environments times, which in this case is four, right? Once with the light source in front of the robot, once with the light source to the right, a third time with the light source behind the robot, and a fourth time with the light source to the left of the robot. So uh, if we have a population, P0, P1, if we have a population of 10 controllers, and we have four environments, for every single generation, we're going to have 40 total simulations. So uh, when we get down to step 22 here, you can see that we have an embedded for loop. The outer loop is going to iterate over all four environments. And in the inner loop, we're going to start up all 10 controllers in that environment, in the eth environment. We're going to start up all 10, so we're going to have 10 simulations running uh, in parallel. And then we're going to have a second inner for loop here, which is then going to go back after all 10 are started up. It's going to go back here and wait for this one to finish. When this one finishes, it collects the sensor data from this simulation, then goes on and waits for this one to finish, collects sensor data from this one, on to the 10th one, collects the sensor data from that one. Now we go to the second environment and evaluate all 10 simulations in parallel again, in parallel again, in parallel again. If you have a very multi-core machine, you can do all 40 in parallel if you want. Doesn't, probably won't save you a lot of time in this case. Okay, so once we've evaluated all 10 controllers in all four environments, as you can imagine, we're going to alter our fitness function to take the aggregate behavior of the robot using that controller in all four environments. Make sense? Okay, so what counts as a successful completion of assignment 10 and what doesn't? 
let's put our little, uh, let me draw this a little bit larger so it'll be easier to see. Obviously, if the robot only travels towards the light source in one out of the four environments, that's definitely not phototaxis. We're going to be giving our robot uh, a light sensor in this case, and the light source is obviously emitting a light so the robot can detect how far away it is from the light. We have our little robot here, we're looking from above, and we put the light source uh, in front of the robot, if it moves towards the light source here, but when the light source is over here, the robot does exactly the same thing in that environment, and this environment, and this environment. That's not what we're looking for, right? It could easily be that evolution just kind of ignores the light sensor information altogether, and the robot ignores the light and just does the same thing in all environments. If you get something where the robot does the right thing in environment one and the right thing in environment two doesn't do so well in the other two, that's sufficient, right? The probability that the robot will move towards the light source in at least two out of the four environments is extremely improbable. So if you're able to show us that, that's showing us that evolution is making progress towards phototaxis. If you get three out of four, obviously that's even better. Two out of the four will be enough to demonstrate successful uh, implementation of assignment 10. Okay, for those ha that have tackled this assignment, why is it so hard to get four out of four? Because the robot doesn't really have the neurons to change its behavior, so instead it has to operate off the same behavior that changes depending on the environment. Okay, so our robot is pretty simple. Its neural network is pretty simple. It's pretty small. There might not be enough neural complexity in there for it to be able to deal with all four environments. Other ideas? A lot of the times it just kind of starts moving with a lot of them in one direction and then slowly turns, so the one like directly behind it Exactly. If you go back and watch the example video that I showed there, you'll often get the robot traveling well in one of the environments, and then in the other environments it starts moving in the same way and then gradually alters its behavior given the environment. Why doesn't it turn and head directly for the light source wherever it is? Why does it tend to show, at least at the beginning, of all four evaluations, the same behavior, and then the behavior gradually diverges if you're lucky. Do they all evolve from the same controller that always starts moving forward? Uh, possibly, right? So the one that you're watching here obviously had a parent and a grandparent and so on, so there's some sort of conservativeness <coughs> in this situation. Because the signal is all the same uh, in the center, depending on where it is, and it has to Remember our discussion about uh, distal and proximal views on behavior. From our point of view, looking down on the robot and the light source from above, it seems obvious that this environment is different from this environment, right? So if these two environments are different, why doesn't the robot immediately start doing something different? That's us looking from a distance, distal perspective on behavior. But the robot doesn't have that luxury. It, it has a proximal view on its world. And its proximal view is coming from the light sensor, which is sitting in the center of its uh, in the center of its body. So at time step zero, this light this light sensor is exactly the same distance from the light source as the light se sensor is from this light source in another environment. At T zero, in all four cases, the robot does not even know that it's in a different environment. It's only when the robot starts moving that it will start to it will start to obtain different sensor values between the four evaluations, which means it takes it a while to be able to actually determine that and do something about it. And if you have a relatively small neural network, there may be relatively few things that it can do about that fact. Question. So maybe we can improve it by giving it four light sensors. So maybe we can improve it by giving it four light sensors. That's why assignment 10 is not the end, it's the end of the beginning. There are a large number of things that you could do to improve phototaxis, and I encourage you to try some of those things out. It's again a good warm-up exercise for your final project. Yeah. Okay.
All right, we'll leave, the, we'll leave things there for now, and we'll return to our discussion about crossing the reality gap. It's all well and good to be evolving behaviors for robots in simulation, but ultimately we would like to take what evolution discovers in simulation and transfer it onto physical machines. We saw one of the early attempts, which was to create a very simple simulation and add noise to the simulation so that evolution can't lock on and over specialize to details of the simulation that are going to be inaccurate when transferred to reality. Uh, last week we looked at the Golem project published in 2000 which was use of a brand new technology called 3D printers which wasn't directly about the reality gap but at least it was a way to automate crossing the reality gap. We could evolve not just controllers, but body plans for robots in simulation, and then hook them up to a 3D printer and have the <coughs> printer print at least some parts of the physical robot and slot in the rest by hand. This is still an ongoing project that we'll come back to in lecture 20, where the dream is to eventually have a 3D printed robot that walks out of the printer. No human in the loop whatsoever. Not quite there yet, but getting very close. Okay. Today, we will talk about uh, my contribution to this project, which is uh, this challenge, which is now known as the Resilient Machines Project. So in the Resilient Machines Project, the, the, the original inspiration was realizing that uh, animals and humans are very good at adapting to the world around them. We want to evolve not just autonomous machines, robots that make their own decisions, but also evolve adaptive machines, machines that can continuously adapt to changes in their environment, including changes from simulation to reality. So I, I don't think I showed this at the beginning of the course, but it's a good motiva motivating slide to think about this problem. What's the difference between the top pair of photos and the bottom pair of photos? We still got people doing construction. We still got people doing construction. Why? Why don't we have automated construction machines? Very noisy environment. It's a very noisy environment, right? So you're all familiar with the challenges of robotics. Uh, now, if we want to build things indoors, we can invent these places called factories. And by definition, they are controlled environments. Everything is the same or as much as possible inside a factory. So the robots don't have to adapt, right? The, we basically build a world around the robots that never changes or changes in very expected ways. That we know how to do very well. Solved pro industrial robotics is a solved problem. We want to obviously deploy robots in outdoor and unstructured environment where they have to continuously adapt their mode of operation. An open challenge. Okay. I'm going to skip over this slide for a moment. So evolutionary robotics approach to this, see, there's actually three approaches. As we saw when we looked at the initial experiments in the field with the little small hockey puck sized Kepra robot running around on a tabletop inside of a maze, or the University of Sussex gantry robot, which was the inverted uh, periscope, we can, in theory, not even require a simulation and evolve controllers directly on a physical robot. But as you all know by now, it takes hundreds or thousands or even millions of, of, of trial and error until you find a controller that works. Not really efficient or time efficient if we're gonna do this on a physical machine. So starting around the 2000s, we introduced physical simulators where we would evolve in simulation and then try and transfer them to reality, which is all well and good, but we need to create the simulation in the first place. And you've been spending the majority of the, the time on your assignments actually building the simulation and putting the robot in there and simulating the, the neural network and the sensors and the motors and probably less than half your time actually focusing on the evolutionary algorithm and the fitness function. If we were to, if I were to give you a new physical robot like a biped, you'd have to throw out your virtual quadruped and build a new virtual biped. You'd have to spend a lot of manual effort tuning the simulation to the task or the robot at hand. So it's still not a very manual problem and it also introduces the reality gap problem. There's a third approach that we haven't talked about too much, 
which is we take a physical robot and we do the best we can to make an approximate controller for that machine and then have evolution tune up that machine. But that has an obvious drawback, which is we need to really think hard about designing this approximate controller to begin with. So these are sort of the, the, they were the existing three approaches to evolutionary robotics. In 2006, we introduced a fourth approach, which we originally called the Estimation Exploration Algorithm, or EEA, which became renamed later as the Resilient Machines Project. What's the idea behind the Resilient Machines Project? Well, we're going to use the simulator to evolve useful controllers, like, like always. But we're going to assume that the simulator itself is either absent or inaccurate. So we're also going to have a second evolutionary algorithm. And that second evolutionary algorithm is in charge of evolving the simulator itself. The fitness function of this evolutionary algorithm, the one evolving the controllers, what's the fitness function for that? Depends obviously on what we want the robot to do, but what would be a, can a typical fitness function for this evolutionary algorithm that's evolving controllers? What are some fitness functions we've seen so far? How about displacement from the starting point? Displacement from the starting point, if it's locomotion, if it's object manipulation, minimize distance between the fingertips and the object those kinds of things. <coughs> if we're going to evolve an accurate simulator, what is the fitness function for that? A real life model where you're comparing maybe some sort of noise there. So it's going to be some sort of comparison, but a comparison between what and what? Uh, comparison to how similar the, task, or the simulation performing task compared to the real life robot. Exactly. So we're going to have to transfer something across the gap, something from simulation to reality, measure the robot in reality and compare it to the robot in the simulator. And the better the match, the better the simulator. Right? Okay. Question. Uh, this is a previous question. How yep. is the third approach you mentioned an evolutionary approach where you're adopting a hand-created controller? So we create a hand, uh, uh, we might take, for example, in the quadruped, for example, if you think hard enough about this problem, you can probably write down a Breitenberg type controller for this. Not exactly a Breitenberg controller, but you could probably get close. It might work okay, but it's probably very unlikely to work perfectly well. So take that hand design controller and the synaptic weights that you've come up with by hand, inspired by Breitenberg vehicles, and then use that as the initial condition for your evolutionary algorithm. And it starts to adapt the weights from there. OK, so why did we name this fourth approach the EEA? This was just a reminder to us as well that there are two evolutionary algorithms at work here. One is exploring. It's looking or searching through the fitness landscape of all possible controllers for our given robot and our given fitness function. The second evolutionary algorithm is trying to estimate it's trying to estimate the conditions of the physical robot and reflect those conditions back in the simulator without us having to do it. That's why we're using an evolutionary algorithm. We're going to try and automatically tune up the simulator. That's the idea. OK, so let's see how this actually works. The reason you're working on the quadruped now is because we've spent a fair bit of time thinking about this particular kind of robot. There's the physical version. It is not that different from the quadruped that you've just programmed up. We have nine parts, the main body, two legs, and each leg is made up of uh, two pieces. And uh, each of the two legs rotate in the plane. There's no rotation forward and, back, forward and back at the shoulder. So we have nine parts and eight motors. However, the, robot, the physical robot itself does not know this. We're going to start by telling the robot the following, that it's made up of these nine pieces that you see here, but we don't know, or the robot doesn't know, how they're put together, which might seem a little bit odd, because obviously we do know. Why not just tell the robot? Well, we wanted to not give it that information and see whether it could create a simulation 
in which all those pieces are put together in the right way. So we're giving the robot some information, but not all the information. It's made up of these non nine parts. They have more or less these shapes and mass distributions and so on. And these eight parts here, these little gray rectangles here, represent motors. So eight of the nine pieces have a little motor at one end. So did the decision to just go with cylinders and boxes as opposed to like triangular Prisms, I guess, sure. Maybe. Yeah. Is that just from the fact that those are not irisen and you had to work with something? We could have probably used prisms and so on. We probably could have described the actual parts in a little more detail. But again, the game we wanted to play here was just not to give it all the information. Say, this is, these are approximations of your parts, and we don't really know how they're put together. You figure it out. Okay. So what does this robot do? It has this information. We also give it a task, which is forward locomotion, as always. But it can't solve the forward locomotion task because it doesn't even have a simulation of itself yet. Of course, it could spend hundreds or thousands of millions of trials trying it out in reality and eventually discover forward locomotion. But before it does any of that, it's going to try and evolve a simulation of self. It's going to evolve a simulator of itself. So I'm going to walk you through snapshots of this first evolutionary algorithm, which is evolving not populations of controllers, but populations of simulators. Question? Uh, in the previous slide, the, um, I guess the leg segments, the ones with boxes on them, is that to simulate a different weight distribution? Than the yes, one? exactly. And also, uh, a shape distribution, right? So there's going to be collision <coughs> detection and avoidance there. So that was sort of an approximation of the body parts of the robot. So is, the, is the genome of the simulator just how these parts are organized, or is it also stuff like, like sensor noise and other stuff like that? Good, great question. So we haven't mentioned the genome. It's, it's what you just said. It's the, the genome specifies how to put these parts together. So the genome is actually uh, nine numbers nine integers where the ith integer indicates how the uh, which object the ith object is connected to so if this is for example at the fifth position in the genome if there's a zero at the fifth position that's the robot telling uh, that's the the genome saying connect this part to part zero i'm sorry i forgot to mention there's nine pairs of numbers the first number is an integer the second number is a floating point value between 0 and 1, which is where on the circumference or around the edge of the object that object should be placed. So 0, place it north, 0.25, place it east, 0.5, put it south, 0.75, put it west, and so on. Yeah. So basically how to put these pieces together. We could add in additional numbers about sensor noise and where the sensors are. We could put a lot more information, but again, we're just trying to keep things simple for now. So far, so good? Okay. Before this evolutionary algorithm even starts, the robot is going to need some information to start tuning up the simulator. The robot has no idea how it's put together, so what action should the robot perform? <laughs> Any action, doesn't matter, right? So at the, out, at the be very beginning of this experiment, the robot chooses a random action. And actions here are limited to a set of simple actions, which are rotate the eight motors up or down. We try to keep things very simple. It's not a neural network controller at the moment. Just rotate your motors and then hold steady. In this run, the, the robot randomly decided to rotate motors one and five down and the other six motors up, which produces the following action. Not very exciting. As it does so, as you can see, its main body tilts about 30 degrees to the right. So this robot has eight motors, as was just described, and just two sensors, two tilt sensors, which detect how much the main body tilts left and right, and how much the robot tilts forward and back. 
So the robot has sent these eight commands to the motors. It rotates those motors and then holds still and records two floats, left, right, tilt, and forward and back tilt. That's it. What does the robot now know about its eight motors, if anything? Imagine I put you in a box, it's completely dark, and there's eight buttons in front of you, and you press two of the eight buttons, and you feel yourself, you feel the box tilt 30 degrees to the right. What do you know about the two buttons that you just pressed? They made you tilt to the right, you know that. Do you know anything more? Um, you know that the motors on the left? You know the motors are on the left. You told those two motors to rotate down and everything else to rotate up. So motors one and five must be over here somewhere, but not exactly where. <coughs> so far so good? Okay, so now we're gonna go, not from simulation to reality, we're gonna go the other way. We're gonna come back from reality to simulation. And we have one piece of data to train our simulation against, which is the, the action, motors one and five down, all the other six up, and two numbers, the rotation of the main body. As you can see in this first evolutionary algorithm, here's a random genome, which is attached objects together in random ways. When I start up this video, in this random simulator, motors one and five are gonna rotate down, and motors, all the other six motors are gonna rotate up. Do you think the main <coughs> green body is gonna rotate 30 degrees to the right in this case? Probably not, right? What is the fitness function? for this evolutionary algorithm that simulate that evolved simulators. Exactly, right? So we have the two floating point values, the actual tilt from reality, and we're going to get back two numbers in simulation, the virt the values of the virtual tilt sensors, and fitness is the similarity between those two pairs of numbers. The better, the closer the the virtual body tilts, to how the real body tilted, the higher the fitness of that simulator, it will produce randomly modified copies of itself and outcompete other simulators that rotated the virtual body more differently from the physical body. Make sense? Okay, off we go. You'll have to apologize my camera work. You'll notice that towards the end of the video, the bodies are all tilting about 30 degrees into the screen. I should have put the camera 90 degrees to the right. Uh, so just mentally rotate this whole video 90 degrees so that in your mind, the green box is rotating 30 degrees to the right at the end. So the robot's done. It says, I got it. I matched the data from reality. I've crossed the reality gap. Um, use that as another starting point and then do another movement. So we know, again, from our privileged point of view, we know that the robot is not done. Does the robot know that it's done? Does it know whether it needs more information or not? Does it? Does it need to do another action in reality to know whether it's done or not? As you'll notice in this video, there are many body plans or simulators, if you want, that, that match the information from reality. And all those simulations are different from one another. Does the robot know that it's done or not? Yes, it knows. How does it know? Because if it was done, then there would only be one body plan that matches all of its data. This robot does not know a lot, but it does know that I can't be all these things. They're all different, and they're all maximally fit. 
So something is missing. I need more information to disambiguate between all of these different guesses about my body. So the robot says, I'm not done. I need to do another trial in reality. OK. Uh, I think we just talked about this. This is how, how the fitness is computing, computed. So the robot is now going to bounce back and forth between reality and simulation. Reality, it's going to perform an action and get back two new numbers, which is the tilt corresponding to that action. It's then going to go back to simulation, and it's going to evolve simulators. And those simulators are now going to have to, we're going to now evaluate each simulator twice not in two different environments, but with two different actions. And now it's going to have to match, a good simulator is going to have to match both observations. You're going to have to mi minimize distance between virtual and real sensation from the first physical trial, and it's going to have to match physical and virtual data, sensor data from the second trial, which gets a little bit more difficult to do, and there are less and less Simulate simulators that are able to do that. So far, so good? Okay, so I'm gonna jump ahead in the videos here, not to the second trial, but to the eighth trial. So this is what the robot chose to do the eighth time around. Not very exciting, but from the robot's point of view, this provides some new information. And I'm going to show you the next video now. And in this video, we're going to see a whole bunch of snapshots. And we're only looking at one out of the eight evaluations we needed to do of each controller. As you can see, even at the eighth trial, it's not doing very well. But during this eighth trial, it has its eureka moment where suddenly it converges on something close to the right answer. You'll see just towards the end of the video, it gets three out of the four legs correct. And then finally, the fourth one. So at the end of this eighth round of evolving simulators, it's converged on variations of its actual body plan. OK. We let the robot continue for a while, even though it was basically done. This is the 16th action that it chose to perform. <coughs> And this is what happened during the 16th round of evolving simulators. The robot says, I'm done. I'm good. I know I am a radially symmetric quadruped. How is the robot's guess about its body? Is it perfect? It's not perfect. Were the bigger blocks originally intended to go closer to the main body, or were they meant to be at the joint? I think this, yeah, no, this is the, I, I apologize with the geometry here. It's not quite white, but they are in the right, the right place. Yes. A little bit of an angle. You'll notice that, right, the legs aren't perfectly straight. They're all bent a little bit. And they're all bent in more or less the same way. Why? They're also not attached. They're not attached, and again, this is PyroSim, graphics, black magic. They, they are attached. Why are they bent? Probably because when it moved to it once, it tilted one way, and so it's a, a, and so when they're bent, it will always tilt that way rather than either way. Getting close. It's not like you said that in reality, it was like start to move that direction, so it was slightly bent, just making no impact on the way it's moving its motor. And that, that's possible, right? So it maybe doesn't matter that they're bent too much. If you look real, if you stare really carefully at the physical robot, although it looks radially symmetric, the mass distribution is probably not symmetric. There's a battery on there somewhere, and usually in robotics, the battery is the heaviest component. So, however, in the simulation, we have perfect symmetry of mass distribution. It could be that the bent legs are approximating the off-center mass distribution. There's also dozens of other things that are probably slightly different between the physical robot and the simulated robot, and they're being captured in the bent legs. As I've said many times before, evolution is not an optimizer, it's a satisficer. So it's come up with a simulation that's good enough 
to explain the 16 experiences the physical robot has had so far. Scott. So if you would add in another, another movable map thing somewhere on the body yep. of all heavy you could do that as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, maybe we could put them. Maybe we could make it easier for evolution to simulate to, to capture the mass distribution of the robot. That would be a good idea. We could have done that. Um, can you populate the um, initial <coughs> population of the best robots from the previous movement? Yes, exactly. So through these sixteen passes of evolving the simulator, we preserve the best yeah. simulators from the previous pass. Yes. So there is maybe a little bit of bias because, again, maybe all of these simulators are derived from the same common ancestor. There may be a mistake, but it's good enough. Right? Actually, we don't know if it's good enough because the robot hasn't done what we've asked it to do yet, which is forward locomotion. So let's see if the simulation is good enough. So we've saved a little bit of effort because we didn't have to sit down and actually make the quadruped in simulation. We got the evolutionary algorithm to do it for us, which is nice, but it comes at a cost that maybe it's not perfect. Now we switch to the second evolutionary algorithm, which should look very familiar to you at this point. We now take the best evolved simulator and evolve controllers. And in this case, this is the best controller we came up with. You're all experts on the quadruped now. It should start to look a little bit familiar. OK. Take that controller, download it in a physical robot, cross fingers and toes, and off we go. <clears throat> So it's better with sound. This was a funded project from NASA. NASA was interested uh, or is concerned about the next generation of robot probes. You send something to another planetary body, lands on the surface a little bit faster than was expected, and something goes wrong. You would like the robot to be able to automatically evolve and deal with situations on site. We are funded by NASA. It took us almost three years to get to this point, building all the rest of the, the algorithm. When we finally got this successful transferal from simulation to reality, it was about 3 a.m. in the lab, and everyone on the team went completely crazy. We were very excited. There was a, another student sitting at another bench that had nothing to do with this project, and he turned around and was wondering what all the hubbub was about, and he pointed at the robot and said, dude, that's the evil starfish. <laughs> so for better or for worse, this has been known as the evil starfish uh, ever since. In this experiment, and it didn't always work, we got a successful transferal from simulation to reality, even though the simulator isn't perfect. So in this case, it was good enough. Would this thing normally have like a simulator on board? So it could do this all by itself independently? It would if we did it today. This was done back in 2006, and we couldn't have the physics engine running on board. But today, sure, no problem. So if it encounters like the edge of the table or something and its leg doesn't give the right feedback, does it assume that it's damaged or does uh, it assume that its environment is changed? Good question. Hold on to that. So if now it experiences something unexpected, what does it do with that information? Is there something different about its body? Is there something different about the environment? We'll come back to that in a, in a couple minutes. As I mentioned, this is uh, another question. Um, Gotcha. Hold, hold on to that thought. OK. Before we switch to thinking about the environment, let's indeed introduce a change. But this is going to be a change to the robot and not its environment. As I mentioned, this was work that was funded by NASA. And they're worried about, obviously, if something unexpectedly goes wrong on impact uh, on a planetary body. As far as we know, there's nobody there to fix the problem. So the robot, if something goes wrong, is going to have to fix itself. If it can't fix itself, can it at least adapt and carry on with whatever the mission is? 
Uh, as you all know, it's uh, incredibly expensive to build and send a probe, millions of taxpayer dollars. Depending on where in the solar system we're sending it, it can take from three to 30 years. Something goes wrong, you wanna make sure that you can recover any science at all from the damaged device. So NASA considered these, considers these kinds of approaches what they call methods of last resort. If mission control cannot figure out what's going on remotely back on Earth and upload a patch, if there is something really seriously wrong and we don't know what the problem is, NASA may cede a little bit of autonomy to the machine and allow it to explore and adapt and figure out a different way to do things to extract as much science as possible from this uh, damaged mission. So we sent one of the grad students in with a screwdriver who mechanically separated the lower part of the uh, right leg, as you see here. The motor is still attached electrically to the robot, so the robot can still send commands to the motor, but it has no effect, right? The robot has no camera, it can't see itself, it doesn't know that this piece is now mechanically separated, it has no pain receptors, it can't feel the fact that it's missing, but it does know that something has changed. Periodically during its mission of walking from one side of the table to the other, it stops and replays some of those 16 actions that it used during phase one when it was trying to learn about self. Most of the time, those 16 actions give the same result. It tilts again 30 degrees to the left. But if any of those 16 actions have anything to do with this motor, it's going to get a different result. So at that point, the robot knows that something has changed, but not what has changed. So what should the robot do at that point, once it realizes something has changed? Recalibrate its simulator, right? So it's going to go back and re-evolve the simulator, but how? It has to do something else before it starts the, to re-evolve. It doesn't have to move. It has this new piece of information, right? One of the 16 actions produced a different result. For that particular action, it's going to throw away the initial results and replace them with the new results, right? So it has a database of 16 actions and sensory repercussions for each of those 16, tosses out the one that, where there was disagreement and replaces it with this new result, and continues evolution from where it left off before, which is this point. So it's going to continue, and sorry, this may be partway through the process here. You'll notice it starts with its original description. It actually hits on the right answer. It then thinks that its right leg has shrunk, but that doesn't make physical sense. That eventually gets outcompeted by the correct answer. So, um, so was it a possibility that it could not get outcompeted by some, like, would your fitness function, I guess, allow for it to come up with a miniature leg and have that? If it's able to explain the robot's physical experiences, Yes. So I've left out one detail, which is, as I mentioned before, the genome is made up of uh, uh, nine pairs, which object is connected to which, and where on the parent object it's connected. There's a third number, which is the, the size of that object. Um, I guess I'm confused why you yeah. added that. So we cheated a little bit, right? It was that we knew we were gonna separate one of the robot's legs. So we gave it sort of this additional alphabet with which to explain its body. So now it's not just how the pieces are connected together, but also their total size, which may seem like an odd choice because obviously in reality, the sizes of robot body parts are not expanding and shrinking. However, it turns out that that additional alphabet is enough for the robot to approximate lots of things that happen. For example, loss of a leg, a leg that snaps in two, a leg that steps in some mud or regolith and is now bigger than it was before. By just allowing evolution to alter the size or the volume, if you like, of these individual parts, it can approximate a wide range of things that may happen to a planetary rover uh, in its in its environment. Yeah. 
Are there some limits that <clears throat> you think would potentially make sense? Like you can't shrink something, like. Um, you can't shrink something down to zero, for example, yeah. which is exactly what it does because shrinking an object down to zero is a good approximation for the fact that that object is not there anymore. So I don't know if you can see it in the video, but there is a teeny, teeny, tiny pink leg on the end of the upper, upper leg here. Okay, so by, again, going back to this first evolutionary algorithm, it can adapt... It can diagnose what's gone wrong. It's come up with a changed body plan. What does the robot need to do at this point to continue on with its mission? It's got to go back to the second evolutionary algorithm and re-evolve a new walking controller for its changed circumstances. So we go back and, and restart the second evolutionary algorithm. And where we left off before is that second evolutionary algorithm had discovered a controller that worked well for a four-legged robot. As you can imagine, when this evolutionary algorithm is unpaused, that previously good, highly fit controller drops in fitness because it's not appropriate for a three-and-a-half-legged robot. Depending on how much that fitness drops, it may be able to produce an offspring controllers, which are a little bit different and maybe work a little bit better on a three and a half legged robot and so on. So the controllers are now having to readapt to not a different environment like in the phototaxis task, but they have to readapt to a different body. We let the second evolutionary algorithm run for a while and it comes up with this solution. Highly fit, the robot gets from the left side of the table to the right side of the table. What's happening here? It's exploiting things in the, in the uh, simulator that might not transfer very well. Such as? Such as standing on the tips of its legs. Absolutely, so the motors here are a, little, are a lot stronger than they are in reality. We were a little bit overly optimistic. We could go back and place motor strength under, under control of the first evolutionary algorithm, if we want it, right? We could keep adding more and more things that we know are probably inaccurate, like we've seen before. What else is interesting about this particular way of moving? Uh, like, really small well. Exactly, so there's, it's doing some other things which may or may not work. Again, the question is, is this good enough? What else can you tell me about this particular solution? It's not going straight, it's turning until by the time it ends, it's facing backward. Remember our discussion about perverse instantiation, right? Evolution gives us back exactly what we wanted, something that displaces itself from the left to the right, but in retrospect, probably not the way we wanted it to move, right? Okay, that's a separate problem that we'll tackle later. Cross fingers and toes, let's see how that controller transfers to reality. More or less, kind of hard to tell, right? Move from left to right. Turns out that's about 50% or I think it was maybe 40% as far as it traveled when it was undamaged, but from NASA's point of view, this is really good news, right? At the moment, any rover that loses half a leg is very unlikely to keep going. Maybe mission control can sort of remotely diagnose the problem and upload a patch. This process, although it's complicated, is completely automated. Did you do anything or talk about transient problems? You know, the problems that sometimes the leg works, sometimes the leg Absolutely. Works. More common failure. Absolutely, right? So now that we've finished this starting point, now we can ask questions like, what kinds of situations can this algorithm cope with? Transient ones, not very well. Depends on how transient they are. The other issue that was raised is maybe the robot hasn't changed, but maybe its environment has changed. Imagine the robot is moving over flat ground and then transitions into uh, an upward slope. How can the robot distinguish between an upward slope 
and the fact that its front leg has broken or be somehow become shorter. Yep. Is, is not an answer to that question, but okay. just a different question. That's fine. Um, so in this example, um, you disconnected the motor. Yep. Essentially, like, severing the leg. Right. But um, in the simulation, there's, it's not dragging a motor. Uh, good point, right? So there are hundreds of differences between this and this, right? Right. This and this and this. And it, again, this is a very simple example. This was a proof of concept. It turns out that despite those differences, it's good enough. We were able to extract about 40% functionality out of this severely damaged machine. We could go back into the simulation and add virtual cabling or the ability to drag broken objects and allow evolution to be, be better approximate reality. You can make the whole simulation take place on like a, another big shape that you can change the angle of and you could have that as another part of the genome. So we have a follow-up paper to this where we did more or less what you described. So now in this first evolutionary algorithm that's evolving simulators, it's able to alter the virtual robot inside the simulator, but also its virtual environment, right? So it can maybe approximate the terrain that the robot is moving over. A separate sensor that just gives you the down, gives you the force, the, the force vector. Possibly, yeah. It turns out that the robot actually can disambiguate between an upward slope and a shortened front leg without requiring an additional sensor. Thinking about thinking is misleading. Might be hard to think about it, but if you sit down with pen and paper and do a little bit of geometry, there are actions that the robot can perform that will give different results if the front leg is broken or it's moving on an inclined slope. Remember that the robot is free to choose actions that extract new information from the world. It doesn't necessarily have to perform a random action. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so let's sort of put all this together. I apologize for these images not coming out here. We have our physical robot in the middle, and we've just described the estimation part of the algorithm, which is this first evolutionary algorithm that evolves different simulators. We talked about this second evolutionary algorithm, which looks more familiar to us, where the robot is evolving controllers for one of these <coughs> simulators, the one that is most accurate so far. It turns and then takes the best controller and transfers it to the physical robot. I've left out an additional detail, which is that there is a third evolutionary algorithm that is helping the robot to, to decide what to do next. So during these 16 trials, when it's trying to improve the simulator, we saw the initial action was random. Rotate motors one and five down, rotate all the six up. Evolved the simulation for a while. At that point, it had optimal uh, simulators, but they had different body plans. What is the second action that the robot should perform? What's the best thing that the robot could do when it's allowed to perform a second action? Something different that would produce the same results. Something different that may or may not produce the same results. So the worst thing the robot could do is do the same thing again. Now maybe its environment is changing, maybe it would actually get some new information, but assuming everything is relatively stable, the robot should not rotate motors one and five down, because it's seen that already. Right? It could choose something at random, which is most likely something different from one and five down. Right? But as Nathan was mentioning, you might want to do something that's as different as possible. But what does that mean, as different as possible? <coughs> something that maybe doesn't involve one and five, maybe? It's kind of intuitive that that seems like the thing that's most different. It turns out that this idea of thinking about thinking is misleading crops up again. Just picking, for example, motors two and six to rotate down is not necessarily very far from rotating one and five down. So the robot now faces this strange challenge of it's not actually sure what to do next. This 
Third evolutionary algorithm is evolving actions. And actions are rotate one or more of the eight motors down and rotate all the rest up. So it's going to search over the space of possible actions that the robot can do next. And the fitness of any of those actions is the one that's going to extract the most new information from the world, from the real world. And how does it go about doing that? Is this based on uh, its flawed perception of self? Possibly. We don't flawed or not flawed. We don't. We don't know. We may know from a distal point of view, but from a proximal point of view, let's take this cartoon. At the moment, the robot says, "I'm either like this, like this, like this, or like this." They're all different, so they can't all be right. They may all be wrong, for all the robot knows. If you could, if you could uh, select one that you know would eliminate a choice. Ah, exactly, right? The robot is looking for an action that will knock out as many of these as possible. Now we're getting closer. So we're actually going to feed as input to this third evolutionary algorithm all of these simulators. We're going to take all the high fit simulators that are different and feed them as input here. And we're going to then search over the space of actions. We're going to take each action and supply it, like in the cartoon here, we're going to supply it to each of the four bodies. What's the fitness of that action that we just sent to those four bodies? The maximum bodies it can eliminate. The maximum bodies it can eliminate, but how? How is it going to? It sent, it sent this action to these four <coughs> virtual bodies. These four virtual bodies move based on the action. How do we know which one is right and which is wrong? The um, action which generates the most difference between bodies. Exactly. It's the fitness of an action is the one that induces the most difference in actions among the four bodies. Why is that the case? Well, let's think about the inverse. Let's say we take an action, we supply it to all four bodies, and they all do exactly the same thing. All four rotate 30 degrees to the right which is exactly what all four would do if the action we sent them was rotate motors one and five down, because it's already seen those. All four bodies say, we know this situation. They're all in agreement, right? That's the worst possible action that we want. So that action should get low fitness. So our fitness function is gonna maximize the disagreement among the movement of the, of the of the bodies. So we're going to evolve actions here, and we're going to then pause this third evolutionary algorithm, and we're going to take the best action, the one with the highest fitness, and that one is going to cause all four of these robots to move in four different ways. But we still don't know which of these four to eliminate. When you say to maximize the movement, you're just, you're just, you're just going to the the two tilt sensors. So maximize difference in movement, maximize difference among the four pairs of tilt values returned by these four robots. Maximize the variance among those values. We can't, we can't eliminate any of the four yet. All we know is that they're all making very different actions. And they're actually, those four simulations are making four different predictions. Right? For example, this virtual robot might say, I think if you perform this action in reality, you're going to tilt 50 degrees to the left. This virtual robot says, you're crazy. If the physical robot carries out that action, we're, we're actually going to tilt 50 degrees to the right. This one says, you're both wrong. We're going to tilt 80 degrees forward. And the fourth one said, all three of you are wrong. We're going to tilt 17 degrees backwards, for example. Right? They're all disagreeing amongst them, some, themselves in the prediction about what's going to happen if we try out that action in reality. So what happens? We try it out in reality. And as we can see from our <coughs> privileged position, this one is going to be proven right. And the other three are going to be proving proven wrong. The fitness of those wrong three are going to drop. They're going to be deleted by this first evolutionary algorithm and replaced by randomly modified copies of the one that we know is correct or close to being correct. 
Justice Overall's on point has handled the fact that the correct one might not have been there at all, and it might have been enough. Yep, they, they may all be wrong, in which case, you know, they're all going to drop in fitness by different amounts. They may all die out and be replaced by something else. Basically, the more wrong they are, the more likely that their fitness is going to be depressed by any new information from the real world. So this idea of looking for a new action that maximizes variance in predictions is a very old, not a very old, it's, a, it's an old idea in machine learning. It's known as query by committee. For those of you that are uh, interested in machine learning, this is a good algorithm to know. If I could smell it, spell committee. The committee here is, in our case, a committee of models, or models of the robot. And we're going to query, or we're going to send a question to the physical system, which in our case is a robot. And that query, which query we're going to send, which exploratory action, is chosen by the committee. And it's the one that causes the committee to disagree in their predictions. If all of their predictions are different, they can't, by definition, all be right. They may all be wrong, or in our case, one of them happens to be right. Very powerful idea if we're running a machine learning algorithm and we have a system that we're trying to learn about, but we can only send a few actions. It's expensive to send something to that machine and get some data back from that machine. If it's expensive to do so, we better be careful about what action or what query we send to the machine. Do people develop EEAs with um, two simulators instead of a simulator in reality? Uh, yes, um, you, there's cases where um, you have a lo-fi and a hi-fi simulator. So you have something which is very inaccurate yep. and it's very, very quick to run. Mm -hmm. And you may then have a hi-fi simulator which is much more accurate and closer to reality but is slower to run. So imagine instead of transferring things from simulation to reality, instead you have a pipeline yeah. of k simulators where the k plus one simulator is reality. And you have controllers that are flowing from left to right and eventually onto the physical machine. Data that's collected from the physical machine is flowing back down and being used to tune up the simulators. Right? If you're an engineer and you create a bridge, you obviously don't create it immediately. You might sketch something on the back of a napkin, lo-fi simulator. If everyone likes that general design, you sit down with some CAD software, create it much more detail, a hi-fi simulator, run some engineering tests on the CAD simulation if everything holds up. You might build a physical prototype, and then finally the final bridge. Right? Same idea here for robotics. Okay, so we now have these three evolutionary algorithms all running to help the robot basically learn to walk and then recover walking if something goes wrong. And this robot is choosing very carefully what to do next. Um, this is also, this project ended up being of interest to developmental psychologists. Developmental psychologists study development or how humans or higher animals develop from infants to adults. If you watch uh, young children, they often do what's called motor babbling. They also do a lot of verbal babbling. You may have mentioned this before. A, child, a young child, if you put it in front of a whole bunch of blocks, will grab them, hit them, throw them, put them in their mouth, hold them up to their eyes, scrape them on the back of their head. They'll do basically everything they can with those objects. The question is, what's going on in the brain of the child as it's doing that? Is it choosing actions at random? Up until this work was published, the idea was, yeah, it looks like it. They're trying to do things that are as different as possible. However, this approach, or query by committee, suggests that children may not be doing what looks to us like random crazy actions, that they may be actually carefully choosing what to do next. They may have guesses about this blob of color they see in front of them, this colored block, or this blob of color they see in front of them. But they may have different guesses, or their brain may have different models of how this thing behaves or how that thing behaves. And they may choose or mentally simulate reaching out and grabbing that blob of color. And their neural models may be making different predictions about that result 
<laughs> and if so, that's the blob of color they, they go after. Nobody knows, but with advances in brain imaging, we may be able to start to study what, how they actually go about choosing what to do next during motor babbling. Just kind of an interesting thing to think about. Okay, uh, let's have a look now at some results. What I just walked you through was one of 30 evolutionary trials that we did. We wanted to see, on average, how good were these three evolutionary algorithms at producing the desired result. So I've drawn here in this little panel um, in outline the actual geometry of the robot. And the solid lines represent the best evolutionary guess at the end of the 16 trials. And the thin black lines that you see here represent how far off the simulated robot was from reality. All of the, uh, then we did a second set of 16 trials starting from scratch, another set of 16 trials starting from scratch, and so on. And in about half of the runs, evolution found more or less the right solution. The other half, as you can see here, that are not uh, in bold, some one or a couple of the objects were placed in the wrong positions. So it wasn't perfect. Maybe with more than 16 trials, all of these would eventually converge on more or less the correct uh, solution. OK. As I showed you in the video of undamaged walking, so before we damaged the robot, this was the gate that the robot came up with. And this was the gate exhibited by the physical robot. And lining up timestamps of the simulation with reality, you can see that the, this good enough body plan was good enough. Most of the time, it's making good predictions about how the physical robot will move if it uses this controller. But there are certain transient periods during which the robot is doing something slightly different from what's predicted by the simulator. If you go back and watch these videos at your leisure, you'll notice that, for example, at this point here, the robot is lifting itself up on its left and right legs and raising up its front and back legs, and it's sort of teetering forward and back. And in reality, it tilted forward, but in the simulation, it tilted backwards. So there was a big divergence between the two in this case. Then the back leg lowers. So regardless of whether it was tilting forward or back, it's now tilting more or less forward and continues on with its walk. Why do you think there was this mistake at this particular point? The imbalance of the battery pack or the mass distribution, right? So there are little hints here that the simulator hasn't captured the correct mass distribution. In this case, we got lucky that inaccuracy didn't matter too much. So this is sort of good news for crossing the reality gap. We don't need to get everything perfect. Sometimes the controller will mask those differences. Even if you tip forward or back, if you've got the right gate, it'll all clean itself up sometimes. OK. This was one of 30 controllers we evolved with the robot to try and get it from the left side of the table here to the right side of the table. So again, my apologies. You need to rotate this in your mind so that these patterns are over here and the black dots are over here. OK. What are these dots? As you might have seen in the video, we put the, we, uh, put the robot on plexiglass and plexiglass on the table. We took the robot and we tried out 30 random controllers on the robot and let it move for about 30 seconds. When it stopped moving with that random controller, we picked up the robot and with a red pen put a red dot on the plexiglass and did that 30 times. What can you tell me about the random controllers? How do they tend to cause the physical robot to move? Randomly and not really in one direction. Randomly and not very much in one direction, which is good news, right? That's what we want. If you look carefully, you'll notice that some they act more of the dots are actually further towards the right than where they started. Turns out there was about a one degree tilt in the table. So there's a little bit of a bias, but not not too much. 
Okay. We then took 30 of we took 30 of the uh, 30 of these evolved controllers and ran them on the simulated robot, which gives us back a prediction, right? Those controllers in simulation are saying, I can get, I predict I can get the robot from here to there. We took those 30 predictions and we drew them on the plexiglass using a black marker. And you can see obviously that most of them lie about 40 centimeters to the, to the right, which is what we want. We took each of those controllers, like the one you saw in the video is, is circled here, and actually played it on the physical robot, and the robot did get to the right, but only about half as far as was predicted in simulation. Question? Meters, right? Meters, meters that's right, so 40, 40 centimeters. Yeah, exactly. I'm Canadian, we do everything in metric. Okay. Tell me about the other 29 controllers. How well did we do on average at crossing the reality gap? Did we cross the reality gap? I see some hemming and hawing. Not bad, maybe not great. The blue, the mean of all the blue points is here, the mean of the red points is here. So in reality, using the evolved controllers rather than the random controllers, we definitely got further along the table than you would at random, but definitely not as far as the predictions actually, the controllers actually predicted, right? So we crossed the reality gap sort of part way. As was mentioned during our discussion this morning, there's lots of things we could place under evolutionary control to try and improve things, like add a virtual weight to allow evolution to easily change the mass distribution of the robot. Given what you know about simulation now, what else could we place under evolutionary control where we wouldn't need to make any other changes to the evolutionary algorithm, either to place those other aspects under evolutionary control to improve our ability to cross the gap? Sorry? Friction, yeah, exactly, right? Friction uh, is pretty inaccurate in PyroSim. We can take some of the parameters that describe friction in PyroSim and place them under evolutionary control. Oh. The robot was moving over plexiglass, which from the robot's point of view was pretty slippery. That is, friction's probably pretty important. What else? Uh, wind and motor strength. Uh, wind and motor strength, yeah, exactly. We were in the lab, so there wasn't too much wind, but if we had done this outdoors or on a planetary body, there may be significant wind. So when I asked you about the motor that was dragging yep. along, yep. Um, I didn't really ask the question in the best way, which is that what I really meant was not that, oh, it, it, it approximated its body and then it learned this gait that was good enough from its universe, so okay. how much data it had. But what I was really getting at was like, could you then try to re-evolve the simulator from, like, could you inform the simulator from now the physical robot is walking, which we now have more data, the motor is now dragging. I see, right, so we could collect data from the locomotion itself, right, which might yeah. give more information than just this tilting and holding still. Yeah. Absolutely, which is probably in reality or a future version what you would do. We wouldn't have separate exploration and, expo and ex estimation phases, it would be learning while it's behaving. Right? Okay. What, what makes us now freeze the controller and then put the other things under evolutionary control to reproduce this distance? Uh, possibly, yeah, you could that say, listen, for, exactly, this controller we know, given the blue dot, this is where you <coughs> should end up. Re-evolve the controller to make sure in simulation you end up at the blue dot, not the not the black dot. Absolutely, we've got more information now, right? Uh, slope is another one we talked about. Slope, exactly, right? We could start to add in objects to PyroSim that it could play around with to approximate different kinds uh, of terrains. One thing that NASA is very scared about is when rovers move over sand or regolith, any particulate matter, which PyroSim is terrible at simulating. We can't simulate particles. Mm -hmm. Think back to our discussion on the radical envelope of noise hypothesis. There are certain aspects of the simulation and reality that are just completely different. Is there something else we could add to PyroSim other than virtual sand that would allow the robot to model and deal with sand? 
I see a lot of hands raised. We're out of time. Think on that, and we'll pick it up here next Tuesday. Thanks very much.